Expedia used to be Orbitz, uh, and when I was at Orbitz, hello, uh, I got this email to, to, to my work email address, and it kind of read like, I'm a Nigerian prince, give me $500. It just, it was kind of shady. Um, but it was being invited to, to speak at a, a data visualization summit. Um, and so at the time we were working, I was in our hotel group, and we were working on uh, responsive redesign of our landing pages. So that was just sort of top of mind for me. So I sort of just crammed responsive in front of something that had to do with data. Came up with this topic. Uh, and so that was a couple years ago, and it was, uh, it was right, a conference like this. It was a bunch, it was the opener for the coffee break on the second day. So it was a bunch of like 20 and 30 year olds just hung over and bored and not really listening. Um, and the talk ended. And this woman, and I want to get this right, she was 4'11", I'd say, in a double-breasted yacht club blazer with a crest, and like the pants from, from David Byrne stopped making sense. Like, I swear she didn't actually exist. She walked up to me, she goes, Mr. Hindman, that was great, let's make it into a book. And then she retired a week later. So, so I met this ghost that I'm not sure ever existed, and uh, she gave me the opportunity to turn this, this short talk at the time into a book, and that sort of gave me a deeper opportunity to, to dig way more into this topic than I ever would have and sort of deconstruct what responsive and, and, and mobile-first design really mean to, to data visualization and data presentation. Uh, and I did that by first going back to the mid-90s. Um, yeah. Uh, and so in the mid-90s, there was this invention that was realistically from the 50s, and it was, it was sort of radicalizing what, what the world was going to be and certainly what our jobs were going to be, um, and it was going to really permeate everything we were doing. What was this thing? Moon shoes, yeah. Um, no, Moon shoes, 1994, also came out in 1950. They were terrifying looking. Uh, Mosaic came out in 1994. The first visual uh, web browser turned into Netscape. It was created uh, at my alma mater, University of Illinois. But going four years before that, uh, 1990, uh, HTTP and HTML were sort of in decent shape uh, and uh, you know, being published. And the first website housed it at CERN was actually describing the World Wide Web project. It was a project at the time. How crazy is that? So, what I sort of want to start with is just the history since then of how we've gotten to what we do with the web. So if you look at the mid-90s, uh, the, the way you got to the internet was on a, a desktop computer, right? And desktop computers sold pretty darn well in 1995. We were at, what is that, 50 million yearly sales. And that line was going up and to the right, which is always good. Uh, we see the, the dip in 2000, the dot-com bubble burst. But realistically, it didn't even go down. Like Sales just flattened for a bit and kept going. And I stopped this, start, this chart at 2007, because obviously this thing came out. And right prior to that, if you had an internet-connected phone, you were either in a commercial for an internet-connected phone, or you were like checking emails about your cocaine farms. Like This wasn't a normal thing that people were doing yet. Um, so iPhone came out in 2007, uh, and it was pretty good for a while, sales-wise. Uh, and then it got really, really great. Uh, and we see in 2011, uh, a year after responsive web design was coined, uh, mobile devices, so phones and tablets, actually overtake desktop device sales. Year, year to year, they're, they're actually beating it and then way eclipse them by, by a, a whole huge amount. And so at that point, we sort of change how we think of the web. And for some reason, we came up with this phrase, the mobile web, which I'm not a fan of because it, it makes it feel like a different thing, right? We call it this. And we forget that we're just doing the same thing in a browser. We're hitting a URL, we're doing a lookup, we're getting information back. And so the mobile web is just the web. And in fact, that first ever website still works really darn well on a tiny screen. The web is flexible. Things will work as long as you don't force them to not work. But in, in, in terms of data visualization, we're not talking about just designing for mobile. Even right, in terms of just how we interact with the web anymore, mobile-first design is not the, the limit of responsive design anymore. When we're talking about consuming and visualizing data, we're really talking about just creating lightweight, universal ways to access this information. So our world doesn't look like this. It looks a lot more like this. Right? Our very smallest screen is no screen at all. It's an API to get to our information. We have to, and realistically, that's our biggest screen, too, because we can take in a lot of information. So right, as, as the Internet of Things becomes less of a catchphrase, more of a reality, and more and more devices are, are giving us data, they're going to be consuming it as well. These things are going to be talking to each other and need to make decisions just based off of how we're presenting this data, whether or not it has a screen. And that's responsive. It's still just the Internet. It's still the same data. And the most important thing is that people either want to reach our data or we want them to want to. 
So really quickly, let's go through progressive enhancement, just as sort of the, the, the core of responsive design here. And this, this reads from the bottom up. And the most important thing that, that people need to be able to get to is the actual data itself, whether it's content on a website or it's actual meaningful data that is uh, going to be decisioned off of. So that's sort of all of the content that needs to be accessible to any browser, visual or otherwise. Markup is then the semantic way that we describe this information, how we structure this information. Uh, so right, it could be a JSON endpoint, it could be XML, it is in a browser, it would be HTML, wrapped around the actual core content. Design then is sort of just how we make it pretty. Like this is the visualization part in the traditional let's make a graph out of it sense. If that went away, we would still have this content. We'd still be able to describe what, we're, uh, what data we have. And then interaction, specifically in a browser, it's JavaScript, right? It's behavior, it's, it's enhancement, it's how you can interact with this data to filter down, to pull other things in, how you can play with it, but it's not necessary to just reading what it is. And so to sort of align to the, this, this idea of progressive enhancement, specifically in, in, in data visualization, I wanna go some of, through some of these, these techniques. Those look really small over there. These techniques uh, that are responsive design specific, not so much data visualization specific because they build a good base for, for what we're gonna be talking about. So being universal means making sure as many things as possible can reach your information. It doesn't need to look great, it doesn't need to do anything, but it needs to be accessible. <clears throat> being flexible means that you don't know how people are going to consume your data. You have no idea what size, bandwidth, screen type, interaction methods, you're gonna to have to solve for. So don't solve for any of them, right? You can't say something is going to be pixel perfect the way you want it. It needs to be flexible enough to not be broken. Being economical is important because something we're always gonna to have to, to, to fight against with, with internet, with, with larger and larger data. Let's just assume big data is data because what the hell is small data? Uh, you don't wanna send a single extra thing until someone actually requests it. You need to send either a sum summarized, actionable uh, default view or the requested filtered view that someone is looking for. And then finally being specific, and that's finding actual points of convergence between uh, how your data is interacted with or groups of screen types uh, and hyper-focusing on where you can get those strengths to make a, a, a more actionable interface. Sound good so far? Cool, good. Here's all the things we can do. Um, it's a ridiculous list of things that you can look up in a browser and see if it's, it's usable if it's available, so let's look at none of them. Um, let's focus down a bit on some more uh, idealistic uh, ways of looking at these tenets. We have these seven things that sort of group a few of those uh, uh, pieces of information together into to higher level uh, ideas of what responsive design does for us. So the first is flexible measure. So we see on the right, your left here, uh, something that's measured in a, a pixel perfect kind of way. We're saying that the, the big blue thing needs to be a certain size, the little gray thing needs to be a different size. We're on the right, we're looking at flexible measure. So we're saying that it's a percentage of the screen. Code-wise, it's that, right? So if it's 800, that would be 1066, repeating, uh, would be the full width. We're saying this thing just needs to be 75%-ish of the screen. We've right away solved that this is never gonna be a size that doesn't at least fit on a screen. Whether or not the content looks right, we've solved for not being uh, flexible. Next is our flow, and this is about, oh, <laughs> I skipped this part. Uh, how you get to that uh, percentage is that your target, the actual thing that you care about, the, the individual element within its container, the division of that is not particularly hard math, that gives you your percentage result. This time it's flow. And flow is simply saying that you can't break your, uh, if we were looking at width previously, we're looking at height now, you can't break the size of your screen to say, I need this to take up X amount of space regardless of what data I'm putting into it. This is showing content in this case, but really our visualizations need to take up as much space as they need to take up to give us something meaningful. So instead of having something that either cuts off or goes too far, we're saying it grows until it, it doesn't need to anymore. Nesting, this is at the markup layer rather than the content layer. This is sort of how we can wrap uh, elements that are related with pseudo elements that, wrap, that, that we can contain uh, these in and then cascade rules down through. So if this is the exact same element on, on the left and the right, and we move from three things that are sort of at the same hier hierarchical level, to simply putting a container around this, it looks the same, but 
ideally, we have something there. This helps us then in defining endpoints and breakpoints. So endpoints are that if that main section takes up 100% width right now, it means that outside of these screen sizes, it's gonna keep growing or shrinking forever. Endpoints give us the idea that we can stop at a certain point and say we don't want it to get any bigger because it then just it, it becomes useless, it becomes a ridiculous way to look at this information. So we do that instead. Breakpoints then, and this is if you're familiar with the responsive design, this is a really important thing, the media query. It reads like a sentence. Right, your media is a screen and you have at least 24 EMs. And let's call that middle sized screen, that sort of tablet -y thing, EMs. In this case, we only want to start floating the blue and the, 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 the gray section next to each other once we hit that screen size, meaning that by default, we're just going to do nothing. We're going to have everything stack at 100% because that's what browsers do for free. We're not over-designing anything. So we move from this to you see on the bottom, we're now stacking all that information. We're only applying these rules when it actually makes sense, when we actually have enough screen size to start actually doing this. Typography is absolutely meaningless to us uh, in the, the, the data visualization wor world, but the way we handle it in a responsive design way is really important and will we'll come up when we move more into the, the visualization space. And that's with web fonts. If we look at how we define uh, fonts within CSS, you can just stack a bunch in order and it'll get the first one that it finds. Well, let's say we do the font we actually want. We have a web font that we can pull asynchronously that looks an awful lot like it as our second case, and then we have a bunch of defaults. What that means is if we have the one we want, great, done. If we need to pull in one asynchronously, it's taking a little bit more data, but we're still darn close. If we can't do that either, we're not breaking any of the content. And this will come up again later, but we still can get to everything that we actually need to display. Finally, images. If you see the two on the top here, they look about the same, but let's call the yellow one a bitmap the blue one uh, a vector. Obviously, as you grow a bitmap, it'll get very sloppy and gross, or you'll have to make a much bigger, heavier, more expensive, wasteful one. So, at least in responsive design, especially in responsive data visualization, we want to, as much as possible, use vectors, use map-based, uh, markup-based images to display our information, because then we can actually bind our information to uh, how we're visualizing it. Good with these? Let's go through a quick example. This is a site I made a couple years ago uh, called The Cocktail Guide, uh, and we'll look at it at a small screen first. Um, it's a really basic visualization within the page, but we see we've got, uh, it's, a, it's a cocktail, it's got some ingredients, it's got some ratios. Uh, just under the, the display of the, the visualization and the image, we see there's some list of ingredients, eventually uh, instructions on how to make it. As we pop up one size, we're not really doing anything with the visualization yet. It's still responsive because it's had to stay within this container. If we look at that, that idea of, of, of nesting, we've done some responsive work to make sure it doesn't break outside of that. It's just growing to the, the amount of space that it has. But we're now, uh, if we look at the ingredients, the instructions, if we highlight ingredients on the, the, the left side, the visualization will light up in that certain spot. We're doing things that interact with it. And so the responsive design of the page itself is affecting the visualization. We go one step further and we've sort of just moved more things. You see on the visualization, we're now pulling in a little bit more information that was not uh, removed by default, but just hidden by default of the cocktail glass, the time of day, and the amount it takes to, to make it. Um, but what's meaningful here is that although we've, we've changed how we display this information visually to the browser, all the social sharing, the image we're pulling in from uh, Instagram, that's also the same information. So we had a JSON endpoint that is all of the same thing. So we're dependent on all this data. We're dependent on all this information on the back end. But we can display it both as markup, both as JSON, and it'll affect uh, how the end user actually interacts with it. So what does that data look like? Well, data comes from what, your own server, from an API, from how do we do data? We live in the world, we observe things, we collect those observations as raw data, then we start to process it and we start to clean it. And this is where we're gonna start to build our endpoints that actually matter. Because then we'll make analyses, we'll build models around it, right? We'll say what this actually looks like as a containerized unit. And once we have those, we can communicate them, we can visualize them, we can report them, and make deeper uh, analyses from those reports and make decisions off of that. And at the decision layer, that's sort of where we're displaying this to people. 
because this part is the least important part. Like this is a talk about visualization, but the visualization we choose should be so disposable that it doesn't actually matter. But what we need is a clean, well-structured API that we can build very cheap ways to just show how the information exists on top of that. Because that way, we're not the ones that even have to do the visualization. Right? We can do the one that we want because we decided it looks good, and Nish talked about this uh, in the last session, that the designers will just pick the one that's right for some reason. We don't have to make that decision. We can pick the one that we want, because too often we pick this. Right? And again, people either want to reach our data or we want them to want to. And by forcing someone to just hit our big disk desktop optimized dashboard that works when you have everything that we've decided you need, it's the same as doing this. And I love this quote. Uh, it's Einstein. If you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. If you're using a visualization to force your data to mean something, then you probably either don't know what it means or you're hiding that you want it to mean one specific thing. He also said that. Um, this is important. The code behind this isn't sexy at all. It's not interesting. It's pretty basic, like applying responsive design to this. The important thing is adapting the mindset from the broader responsive design to strictly data representation. Let's go back to this. First five are exactly the same. All right, so if we start applying these to data visualization, prettiness and pixel perfection of some visualization is impossible because you don't know what amount of screen space you're gonna have, you don't know how anyone's gonna interact with it, you don't know if you're gonna have a screen. Flow, data should be what dictates the real estate you're actually using for this visualization, whether it's no real estate at all with the API, you have room enough to have a sentence just giving you the action that you're doing, or you have a full suite of pretty visualizations of what it's actually gonna be uh, shown to the user. Endpoints, this is again just setting minimum and maximum for what, the for what sizes the visualization actually works at. Again, the minimum is no screen at all. And no screen is actually your first breakpoint, right? At a certain point, you're gonna move from interacting with something that doesn't view the information to having to convince a human that this is meaningful. So one style of visual visualization might not even make sense at a certain size screen. And you can set these breakpoints within your code to start growing or shrinking how you interact with this data. Images, yeah, we're gonna be building SVGs. This is gonna be a talk about D3 at the end of it, surprise. Because um, we can tie our data directly to how it's being displayed then. Like the images are pivotal to if we're deciding to actually make a visualization at all. We need to back them in with code that can change cheaply and easily rather than throwing images at a user. So the two other points uh, relate to the fact that with normal responsive web design, right, we know what the content is almost always. We have text and images on the screen, but the other input we have to data visualization is the size of the data set itself. Whether it's very complex, very not complex, but big, small but complex, or if it changes when the user interacts with the page and how that affects how we display it. So I show this first one as grouping points, uh, and it's, it's hard to see on a screen this big because I had to make it big for a screen. Um, but assume this was like very far away. This is a data set with 1,000 points. This is the same set with the points grouped to 250. People in the back, that looks about the same, right? Yes, Phil. This is important, right? Because if you're taking trending off of it, if you're visualizing to make this the most easy way to gain information, make a decision off of this data, you can do it a lot more efficiently with 250 points. You're pulling in less data. You're doing the work to slim this down. And again, not great to tell, but that just looks fuzzy and gross on a small screen. So this gives you the efficiency part. This also gives you the universal part because you're no longer sending all of your information at once. You're sending the most uh, uh, necessary and actionable for, for a specific device. The last one is layering. I have certain thoughts about the Apple Watch, but I love this app. Um, and this is the default view for that app. And I think it's very on purpose, the most actionable view, right? This is a summarized view of everything you can look at. 
But what does it give you? Um, let's go through everything. Move is represented by the word move and the color red and an arrow moving forward and the user has completed 55%-ish of move. Exercise is the word exercise and two arrows going forward and green and they've done 45%. Stand is blue and the word stand and an arrow up and 25%. And you're also on view four of six possible views. That's a ton of information. And like a lot of times, right, you might just look at this app and decide that's enough, I need to stand more. <laughs> but if not, it's really obvious how you can get to a, a, a more granular view. So it's layered to be the most actionable, whether the action is, yep, I'm done, or I need to keep digging. So we dig down to this, right? And we now have a lot more information for any one of these views. And if we think of how that first views API would look versus this one, you can start to see that you can build very cheap, lightweight APIs as your most uh, actionable view and then only force download of a lot more information when someone requests it. Because there's another view that has a ton of stuff. Um, right, it has all the metadata, it has the goal, the total, the name, the colors, et cetera. But it also has these, what is it, 72 20 minute increments for, uh, for, for stand, for exercise, for move. And that's a lot of data. That's a lot more than you would actually want to send to the user. It gets heavy. So let's go through what these APIs might actually look like. First of all, a good API. Let's talk about that. It should be open, right? As accessible as you, your legal team allows. You want people throwing things at this to decide what is actually a useful endpoint for anyone, not just yourself, because you're going to have your uh, idea of what you actually need, and it might be totally missing uh, some very pivotal summarized endpoint should be bulk and structured. It should be all of your information in a way that is built into models that you've found to be the most useful to fit your needs or represent some containerized whole that may have some uh, analog to something real world or just is a, a, a container of data that fits well together. And when it's structured, it should be searchable, right? Can someone search the data and find something they're looking for on purpose? should also be sortable. Can related fields across different items be compared, evaluated, can they be filtered on, and can uniform items be ranked by an individual field? And should also be machine processable. Basically, can a machine do those two things I just said without any human intuition at all? And finally, it should be identifiable. Its web address should be globally unique, right? You should be able to get to this data by typing something into a URL, it should be restful. And that should, as much as possible, identify and give some context to what information you're getting back. And then the data should be 100% unique in case you plan to merge it with other data and you don't want to start a huge fire. Let's hit another quick example before we go back to that, uh, that app. This is the, well, it's my version of the CTA, Chicago Transit Authority's train tracker. Uh, the CTA has very generously called what they have an app, um, but luckily they also have an endpoint of getting to all that data. So, this is the default view. It's definitely not the one that you're gonna look at and say, yep, this is all I needed, but it's the most actionable. This is, I need to get information for a certain train line. Right, that I'm moving to, I pick the blue line. This again, you can see is sort of, if the first layer was a bunch of train lines, this is now a bunch of stops on one train line. And then finally, I picked a spot, these are the ET, ET, a, <clears throat> ETAs for that individual spot, stop. You could sort of see what this would look like without markup on top of it, right? If there was no design here, it would be these layers of data. So that's a, that's a good API. Yeah, I, I, I'm gonna sit here and just let you guys read it. No, I'm not, that would be boring. Granular access. Before you summarize anything, you need to be able to get to any point of this, right? You should be able to get to B1. But if you're starting to sort and filter, you should also be able to get all of B and all of 1. <clears throat> value typing means that as much as possible you should give some sort of uh, unique identifier or type to different elements. So right, we have this list of stops that we probably don't need that they're on the blue line, but it identifies these stops in such a way that if we're not looking at this specific view, we can still filter back to what this view would be. Next, it should be RESTful with a standardized format. We talked about this already, but if we had my API, it tells a story here, right? I'm getting all of my items that happen to be tagged as green, I can get them as JSON, or I can get them as XML. You should be able to tell a story with your RESTful endpoint. 
We get a ton of errors for free from the web. I hate seeing uh, uh, the companies that I've worked at uh, are very guilty of this, making up our own error codes when we get a bunch for free. And your API can do the same thing. You can debug this by just actual things we get from HTTP. There's no need to reinvent the wheel. We should be as, again, universal as possible. Browsers support doing this. And your intent should be your URLs. When you start seeing how you are summarizing or filtering or grouping the very granular data, that should be the next thing you expose to people. That should be the next way that you start to create this robust API. The rest just means make it good. So let's go back to the summary view. We sort of went through everything that we have uh, displayed on this, and it's a lot of pieces of information. But let's look specifically at move, what the actual API to move would be. Probably just that, right? Red is the markup, the icon, excuse me, red is designed, the icon is markup. The fact that we're even putting in the circle is, is design. All we need to get to all of our move information here is move goal and total. Maybe not even goal and total, it could just be a percentage, right? It could be 0.55. That's really small, that's really lightweight. If we're trying to get to as actionable an interface as possible, this is also the most economical way to get to that. Let's go to the next one. We have these a little more granular views. Let's say we went with that 0.55 in the last one. That means that now what we need to add is our goal, our total, our units. And again, that's it. Right? This is still really cheap. And we're not pulling in any of the, the information that we would have had to have for, for exercise or for stand. Because this is all we're displaying. But because it's not the default view, this is something that someone has decided, I want this information. Finally, the big fancy view. Still not much new. Right, it's something like this. All we're adding now is those increments. And we're not adding them for the other two types of movement because we didn't ask for them. It's granular in the sense that it's related to one specific type of movement. It's summarized because it's one specific view. So let's back this with the actual code. Like I said, yeah, of course, this is a D3 talk because D3 rules. Um, and it rules because it allows you to bind this data to the DOM, right? It's not like some app that you have to cram in and have someone download and it has no relation to what you're actually using it for. You can use it to make a table from an array of numbers. You can use it to make some beautiful interactive. You could use it to make that app that we just went through. Like, it, it, it's got a lot of power because it's just browser things. Right? You can read that if you want, but all it means is that we're not reinventing anything. It's just a library of functions that wrap what would be a pain in the ass to write for ourselves. Sounds like typography in responsive design, right? Yes. And it does because if we had some default view, if we're rendering all this information, say, as a table on the client, and then we pull in D3 and we have it do some work to modify that data, that's great, but if it goes wrong, we still have a backup. We're still fine without it. I'll prove it. Here's some vanilla JavaScript that grabs a bunch of divs with the class name change me, throws them in an array, and gives them a height of 50 pixels. Woo! We can do that same thing in D3. It's just a wrapper for that stuff. So now if we start to connect it to some minimal dumb data, Let's say instead of 50 pixels, we do random times the elements uh, index in the array times 100 times pixels. And we can do something like that. It's cool. It's just browser things. It's JavaScript, which means it's interaction, which means it can go wrong. But it's not reinventing the wheel. It's very economical. So let's throw actual data at it. Not complicated data, but actual data. The data part is where it says data. This time, let's just do that times 100 times pixels, and it'll show up. So, SVGs. We were doing divs. That's dumb. Divs are the, the meaningless little nothing of, of HTML elements. So we talked about this before, and how SVGs are not only scalable, but they're built with code. Right? They're markup. That's really cool, 
We should be pumped about this stuff because browsers really support them super well and they're tiny. So instead of some divs, let's say we have this SVG. It is one, two, three, four rectangles that are actually squares. There they are. And let's say we have this data. Now, Bill, that's five things. How that, how's that going to work? Well, you, you just hold your horses. We have those five things. And you'll see that I highlight that enter in a moment, spoiler. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to use those, those five pieces of information to change the, let's see, width of the elements and sort of move them across in, in a row. And then the index is going to be the height. And so these four squares can turn into five rectangles. The other one shows up because we've told it to. We've used code to, whenever we want, append a rectangle that then will do that same thing. And if we lose one, right, if we go down to three, exit will do the exact opposite. We happen to remove it in this case. We could have it fade out. We could have it turn red. We could have it do whatever we want because we're the ones writing this code. In this case, it's just going to go from this to goodbye. Those. Cool, still good, still with me? Let's make it actually responsive. Two terms that we're going to use here are the domain and the range. The domain is the set of values for your input data. This is the actual information, the actual data that you're going to be mapping to the screen. So if your number that you're trying to represent is 1,000, your domain is 1,000. The range is how that actually maps to the screen. So if it's 1,000 and it's halfway to your, your endpoint, then it's going to be 0.5. Right? Your range is what it actually maps to in the, pic in the pixel sense. And that sounds an awful like measure from before, right? Now, we can't just change all of our measure within, within an SVG to some percentage number. It just doesn't work that way. But if we're connecting ourselves to using JavaScript, then we might as well keep using JavaScript. And we can say every time we have a change here, we can just measure where this would go. So instead of always having it, the browser for free, give us some percentage basis, we can just do the math to do it, and it's exactly the same. Target by context is result. It's just going to be domain over total is percentage, which is our range. So we have this as our default. Let's say we did some server-side JavaScript. That's always fun uh, to, to show this by default. And then we have someone interact with it, and we add these, these new elements in. Our old ones are still there, but you see that we actually added something that was outside of our range, excuse me, our domain. And we had to recalculate what our range would be. Well, that's fine. That's cool. Right? Our domain is always just going to be the extent of our smallest to largest numbers, and D3 allows us to do that. Then we just redraw everything, and we'll recalculate the range. It's easy. What about when we change the screen size? What about the normal way of thinking of responsive design of just playing with how big your browser width is? We can do that too. We have our range. And what we can get is every, we can pull the size of our container. Right? We've containerized this element to be the SVG. That's going to be our total available width. And we can just redraw whenever we've done a resize. The last idea here. It's connecting it to a sort of a breakpoint idea. And that's, at a certain point, we're going to want to display something totally differently. We're not just going to want to shrink and grow in, uh, uh, flexible uh, visualizations. We're going to actually want to make a change. And so this is the concept of modes within our re resize. Let's say that either we have a default screen size or we have a, a, a library of breakpoints that we're sort of making all of our actual design decisions outside of our visualization at. We can map our visualization to that. So we have on resize, we're going to want to handle our resize. It's a clever name. Um, and we're going to get our width. And let's say we map our, our, our breakpoints to 1024 pixels, 960 pixels, 640, and then our default would be below 640. Right? Yeah. Well, we just pass that mode into our redraw. And so when we're entering, we're exiting, we're recalculating recalcul our domain, our range, we're doing all of our work to make changes based on, on our data. We're also passing what exactly we want to do. This is sort of the biggest concept here. I'm going to pause because I have like three minutes to go through six slides. Questions here. 
<laughs> All right, cool. Because again, that's the really boring part, that's the code. And I love this quote. Uh, it's one thing to write code, it's another to humanize technology so it serves a purpose in people's lives. People either want to reach our data or we want them to want to. And so we need to support getting this data on as many devices, internet connected, anything, as platforms as possible. We need a solid API that can consume our data. As, and as soon as we respond to actually having a screen, we need to be flexible. We need to not be opinionated on how everything except the data is handled. Because we're not going to be able to say that this is going to look a certain way for a certain screen at all. We have too many screens. We need to be economical. Bandwidth is always going to be a pain for us as we're sending more and more data. So sending a huge pile of data is wasteful. We need to find summarized, grouped, actionable interfaces that can move layers in and out to what the user actually wants. And then finally, we need to be specific to find key points of convergence between devices that you can use and reuse and optimize for. Aren't this scary? Those are the 1950s moon shoes. Um, I would never, ever stand on one of those. I feel like I would get tetanus just looking at them too long. And I think this is actually where we are right now in, in this, this responsive data visualization world. We need to build this stuff in a way that we're not limiting ourselves to the screens we have right now. Like the, at the time, we, we used springs and toys because that's what we had. We can look forward. We don't know what screens we have, but we can just not build for screens. We can not hinder the sorts of things that we'll need to consume our data in the future. Thanks. Uh, I work there. I don't know how to sleep, so I do design stuff there. And as mentioned, if you like this stuff, it's a book. It's 40% off on Amazon right now. Most of it, good chunks of it, are available for free there. So just look there instead. Thank you very much. <laughs>